Justice Department, Missouri governor can't void federal gun laws. The Justice Department, the Justice Department is warning Missouri officials that the state can't ignore federal law after the governor signed a bill last week that bans police from enforcing federal gun rules. Justice officials said the U.S. Constitution's supremacy clause outweighs the measure that Governor Mike Parson signed into law Saturday. The new rules penalize local police departments if their officers enforce federal gun laws. Acting Attorney, uh, Assistant Attorney General Brian Boyton said, he's just an assistant, <laughs> said the law really threatens said. to disrupt the working relationship between federal and local authorities. They said in the letter, noting that Missouri receives federal grants and technical assistance. Now, see, here's the, here's the key that he said right here. Disrupt the working relationship between federal and local authorities. As we told you guys the other day, the federal government needs local authorities. The local authorities don't need the federal government. The only thing that they that they do need is this uh, thing called money that yeah, they, they, need. they rely way too heavily on the federal government for. Quote, the public safety of the people of the United States and citizens of Missouri is paramount, Boyton wrote in the letter. Well, that's a very strong word letter then. <laughs> President Joe Biden has made gun control laws a priority of his administration, and the House has passed two bills requiring background checks on firearm sales. Mm. Oh, my God. We already have them. <laughs> you know, well, this I, gets away from the, the gun show loopholes. You know, yeah. It stops those because that's, that's a big deal. And an expanded review for gun purchases, though they face a tough road in the Senate. But states, including Missouri, have increasingly worked to loosen uh, gun laws, including abandoning requirements that people get training and pass background checks to carry concealed handguns. Missouri's law would subject law enforcement agencies with officers who knowingly enforce any federal laws to a fine of about $50,000 per violating officer. That's how they're going to get their money back. Republican lawmakers <laughs> who work to pass the bill have said they are motivated by the potential of more restrictive gun laws in the Biden administration, but state Democrats have argued the law is unconstitutional and have predicted it would not pass a challenge in the courts. The Justice Department argued in the letter that the state lacks the authority to shield any Missouri businesses or citizens from federal law or to prevent federal law enforcement officials from carrying out their duties. Boyton said the bill, quote, conflicts with federal firearms law, laws and regulation, and federal law would supersede the state's new statute. He said federal agents in the U.S. attorney's offices in the state would continue to enforce all federal firearm laws and regulations. Now, what they're using here is what they call the supremacy clause. Okay. Now, do we have, uh, do you have the supremacy clause up? I have a really good thing from the 10th Amendment Center coming up here. Uh, right right after this, talking about the supremacy clause. So I didn't put the actual one in here. One thing uh, David said in here that is a good thing to point out, and in the law, they basically said the federal government can still come in and enforce their laws, but the local departments are not going to do it. The, mm -hmm. So the local departments are barred from doing it, but the, they're not saying that they're going to block federal officials from coming in there and enforcing the laws. But what Charlie keeps making the uh, the good points on is that the federal government doesn't have enough people really to come in and enforce all of these laws across sure the entire state. Don't. And so they need the local departments to do this. And so that's what they are upset about. But of course, the federal government can still come in and do this, I guess, if they are enforcing actual laws. And we just really need this to go to the Supreme Court who just might not do anything. Who knows? Yeah. <laughs> well, so let me just read Article um, 6 of the Constitution for you. It says, All debts contracted and engagements entered into before the adoption of this Constitution shall be valid against the United States under this Constitution as under the Confederation. Now, the second clause in Article 6 here, This Constitution and the laws of the United States, so that's federal law and the Constitution, but here's, uh, here's a, a few very important words, which I think the Tenth Amendment Center will go into more detail. Mm -hmm. So the Constitution and federal law, in essence, which shall be made in pursuance thereof. Now, that's, that's kind of tricky wording, mm -hmm. okay? But we'll get into what that actually means. And all treaties made or which shall be made under the authority of the United States shall be the supreme law of the land. This is the supremacy clause, Okay. And the judges in every state shall be bound thereby anything in the Constitution or laws of any state, to the contrary, notwithstanding. And that's also very important right there. Um, laws of any state, to the contrary, notwithstanding. Contrary to what? 
Well, the laws of the United States. But what is the laws of the United States? What's federal law? And how can federal law be made? Well, it spells it out right here in these very few words. It shall be made in pursuance thereof. In pursuance of what, Nate? The Constitution. The Constitution. So what we really Hallelujah. need. Hallelujah. What we need, which I'm not a big fan of the, you know, the Supreme Court issuing these massive rulings that change anything, but what you would need here is a case precedent that says whether or not these laws are actually constitutional. And so if they were to strike that down, obviously they would be able to get around the supremacy clause. But if they are actually found to be in pursuance of the constitution laws, then the states could run into a little bit of trouble there. Although I don't know what the federal government's going to do other than cut money off them because they're not going to go to war go to war with the states, what they do is they take money from them and then they hang it back over their heads afterwards. Mm. And so anyway, but yeah, there's this thing for the 10th Amendment Center explains so it pretty well. So the Supremacy Clause is one of the most misunderstood and abused provisions in the Constitution. Nearly every American will tell you the Supremacy Clause means the federal government is absolutely supreme in all it does. And you learn that in school. I learned that mm -hmm. in government class in eighth grade, Constitution class or whatever, that the it goes to you know, your local, then your state, then your federal government sits on top and rules all everybody. Man. That totally sounds like something the founders would have I'm done. Pretty sure it was even <laughs> in the schoolhouse rock. Yeah. By the way. <laughs> and uh, here, continuing on here, and every one of them is wrong. It's nice. Uh, it's not condescending at all, by the way. It's just no. spitting facts, straight facts, no cap. <laughs> the problem is they leave out the most, the three most important words in the clause. And this is what we just talked about in pursuance thereof. Probably the name of a metal band. <laughs> That's a good In name. Pursuance thereof. Yeah. We are pursuance thereof. <laughs> the, fe <laughs> the federal government is only supreme when its actions are in pursuance of the Constitution. And since the Constitution delegates very few powers to the general government, it isn't supreme very often. <laughs> in fact, the people of the states are supreme and sovereign in the American system. Hence the Tenth Amendment, by the way. How we just skip over that all the time? Doesn't matter. The people of the states created the federal government and delegated to it a few enumerated powers. Yes, the federal government enjoys supremacy within its sphere. But once it moves one inch outside of its sphere, it possesses no supremacy at all. The biggest government guy in the history of, Ameri of the American founders was Alexander Hamilton. And even he, as big a government guy as he was, who fought for central banks and all kinds of stuff, he explained this in Federalist number 33, quote, if a number of political societies enter into a larger political society, the laws which the latter may enact pursuant to the powers entrusted to it by its constitution must necessarily be supreme over those societies and the individuals of whom they are composed. But it will not follow from this doctrine that acts of the large society which are not pursuant to its constitutional powers. And this is what is so fascinating to me when you go back and you read all of the writings of the founders is they were very, very careful in the way they, they worded their writing to show that the federal government, because everyone was afraid of a federal government. Back then, when you were fighting for liberty against this massive empire of the British Empire, you were afraid of the federal government and judges and sheriffs and all the kinds of people who abuse their power. And so that's why they started with the Articles of Confederation to begin with. And then they, when that experiment failed, they said, hey, hey, we need to come together and like let's renegotiate this thing and be very, very, very careful about how we say these things. And so he's essentially what he's saying here in old, old, old English terms is that when a a group, when a union, essentially a group of a small society enters into a, a large agreement Right, that agreement remains supreme as long as though or I'm sorry, the laws that that larger agreement has made remain supreme as long as it's made in pursuance of its enumerated powers. If so, he continues on here. Um, but it will not follow from this doctrine that the acts of large society, which are not pursuant to its constitutional powers, but which are invasions of the residuary authorities of the smaller societies. He called them inva invasions. Mm -hmm. 
uh, will become the supreme law of the land. These will be merely acts of usurp uh, usurpation and will deserve to be treated as such. So he's saying that if you surpass your enumerated constitutional powers, then you're usurp usurping your power. Hence, we perceive that the clause which declares the supremacy of the laws of the union, like the one we have just before considered, only declares a truth which flows immediately and necessarily from the institution of a federal government. It will not, I presume, have escaped observation that it expressly confines the supremacy to laws made pursuant to the Constitution. Yeah, that's, uh, that's pretty clear. Uh, he does make it pretty clear. He goes on to say the Constitution clearly limits federal supremacy to those objects falling within the general government's delegated powers and not one iota beyond them. When the federal government takes an action outside of its... Uh, of its uh, outside of its delegate it is as hamilton said void okay so when they're not made in pursuance of the, for instance let's just take one by the way let's say that um let's say that missouri made a law that said that decided they were going to form a state supported religion and you were only going to be able to follow this religion and actually you had to and it would actually be the only one that the state would allow to have in it in its state well the First Amendment says that we're not going to have an official state religion. And so the federal government would enjoy their supremacy clause when it comes to this because they would be able to come in and say, even though you made that law or even though you're doing this, you're not doing this. Uh, our Constitution does supersede yours in this fact. Or if they decided to say, hey, we're going to have slaves again, okay? Later on down the road, when it was in the Constitution, you could have slaves. Obviously, you're going to say, well, we're going to have slaves again. Well, you would say, well, no, actually, this is this is our job. And we've said here in the Constitution, uh, it's uh, one of the amendments here, that you can't do that. And so they would have their supremacy clause to help them out again when it comes to that. But when it is uh, these random gun laws, which we don't know if they're actually going to be declared constitutional or not, we don't really know whether or not they are, they're definitely not in the constant there's no amendment saying that the government should be able to force you to get background checks or some, anything yeah. like that then they don't get to come in and say that they have the supremacy when it comes to this actually the only thing we see in the constitution is that people have the right to bear arms and it shouldn't be infringed shall not <laughs> it shall not it's it says shall not in there you know it'd be interesting if if the states would challenge the federal government on its purview over health care yeah and in violation of the 10th amendment like, that's what I want to see. Mm -hmm. Like, you tie these two things together here. The states have grounds to sue the federal government on the fact that there's nothing about the Constitution that gives the federal government any power or purview over health care at all. And in fact, they're in violation of the Tenth Amendment, which says that anything not delegated to the federal government is left into the states and to the people. I'm sure it's the freaking commerce clause or something like that was what they would go back to. Something yeah. like that. That just my guess. They use it's a catch all for everything. But I'm saying that's what I would yeah. That's what I would attempt to try to challenge. Now I don't know if it that it would go anywhere either, but but um yeah, I mean the 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 founders were extremely clear and they expanded on the supremacy clause because look, this came up in debate, by the way. That's what these papers are, by the way. If you go if you go back and read them, this came up in debate. And Alexander Hamilton was like He's essentially like, what do you mean? Everyone knows. Come on, man. Come on, man. Come on. The supremacy clause. Of course the federal government's not supreme. He actually said you guys are a bunch of federal supremacists. Yeah. Okay. It's like, what I'm are you, sick of this federal supremacy. What are you talking about, bruh? Listen, it o it's only with their powers that we gave them that's the only time they're supreme everyone knows this you should be able to why track do i this? have to explain it and it's pretty obvious in that time it was more obvious because you literally had the states that came together to form the united states government the federal government they came together and they gave them a certain amount of powers that they could do so it was more obvious in this time that obviously the federal government couldn't then just magically come up with these things that they could all these new laws that they could put over all of the different states because the states created the federal government and so it was pretty clear to them in that time still well, how are they going to do that we create we freaking made them what are you talking about man mm -hmm. this is good, good morning liberty